So my fall sweet corn is getting ready and um, I won't say it was a complete disappointment, but it didn't, it didn't, uh, my ears didn't get quite as big as I'd like them to. I'll show you a few of them here. There's an example of one right there. Yeah, it looks like I still got a little work to do with you on corn. Uh, I ain't got no worms now. And it looks pretty good. Nice bicolor peaches and cream right there. Oh, look at there's a little worm up there. A little one starting, but he ain't, starting there. He ain't big enough to do no damage. No. Uh, I hadn't sprayed him in a few weeks, but how's that ear look? Looks good. They just ain't, ears ain't real big. No, they ain't. And, um, I'll work with you on that next year, try to help you along on that, because you know corn growing is kind of my thing. We all got our things. Yeah. Like corn. Yeah. I'm yeah. the corn magician around here. How's it taste? That's good. Looks pretty. I haven't boiled any yet. These are my first ears I pulled. It ain't yeah. as sweet as that honey select product. No, it ain't, but I like that. That's good. So let's say hey to everybody and we'll talk about this mm -hmm. a little more. Hello everyone and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. I'm Travis. I'm Greg. We've got a really good show planned for you tonight. We're excited that you're joining us. We're going to talk about some not so well known vegetable crops that you can grow um, this time of year in the cool weather. But before we get to that, we always have some show and tell. And if this is your first time on our channel, welcome. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button and the bell button below so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you're a frequent viewer of our show and our channel, it's always good to have you back. Absolutely. So this is what happens when you don't get enough fertilizer on your corn. And I just, I thought I, I was in between loads of chicken. If I would have put some of that chicken stuff down there, it would have been just fine. But I was in between <laughs> loads and... But I mean, it two is of the what, most common mistakes I see people grow in a backyard corn crop are not enough fertilizer, and they don't plant it in plots. Squares. They want the squares. They want to plant two or three long rows, and it messes up your pollination. You want to plant it in squares so that it pollinates by the wind. And let me tell you, when you know you got enough fertilizer, when you burn the tip of that leaf just a little bit, you know you got enough fertilizer on corn. Yeah, it takes yeah. a lot of phosphorus, takes a lot of nitrogen for corn. Yeah, so. We ain't gonna get a truckload of corn, but we're gonna have plenty to eat. I don't know if we'll put up any, but uh, we'll have some nice little fall corn to eat right there. Yep. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Well, Normally we'd want the cob to be right. about twice that big round, but it is what it is. And speaking of- And I think it's strictly a fertility problem. I think you're probably right. I think you're probably right. Uh, speaking of uh, you bragging about your corn growing skills, I. The other day when you came out of my garden, I felt like you had a little bit of garden envy uh, when it come to my cabbage and collards and, and stuff like that. Your rutabaggers and your cabbage and all was looking real good, looking better than mine, and they were looking good. I have to give you that. Yeah, they were looking good. You got you got it down pat on your brassicas. You're working <laughs> good on that. I made a mistake on mine. I didn't incorporate my fertilizer like you did into my soil, and that makes a huge pre-plant. I'm talking about pre-plant. I got in a little bit of hurry and didn't do that, and I think that's where I, I fell behind. Just with that bit. chicken litter and stuff, you really <clears throat> need to till it in. Yep. Uh, I got a couple what I like to call hot spots, and I'll have to show them on a video uh, where I didn't get it tilled in as well, and uh, you can tell. So uh, it really needs to be incorporated well in the soil. It does. I've, I've done that in the raised beds, and I can tell a huge difference in it. And let me tell you something. Now's the time of the year where everything's growing good. we cooled off. We've got an inch and a half of rain this week. Everything's looking a lot better. Our insect pressure seems to be dipping down just a little bit. Things are happy in the garden, in the greenhouse, and growing. And i got some collards on to show everybody. Go and get them. So the other day, we had a fellow stop by here, a grown man. I'm talking about a grown man and he was from uh, Georgia and I'm not going to call it his name but I'm going to tell you he was from Meriwether County. Okay. And he looked at me directly in the eye and told me he'd never eat collars before. And I thought hit the floor. I said to myself a grown man ain't never eat collars before? And I got to thinking you know there's probably a lot of people out there like that. We take it for granted but if you ain't never eat collars before I'm going to give you a little short course on what you need to be doing. Now these are the top bunch that we grew in a raised bed in Tiger. 
Yeah, excuse me, tiger. We grew it in the raised bed. It's actually Miss Hoss's collards, not yours. Well, it is, but I did help her. Along <laughs> with it. I gave her some consulting on this. But you ain't got to have a big area to grow use. We got two four by eight beds, and we have eaten collards two or three times and gonna eat several more. You ain't got to have a big area to grow these collars. You can take your little raised beds and grow uh, enough for three to four people in those if you crop them like we uh, tell people to do. Mm -hmm. Now this is, this is, I'm gonna give you a simple little recipe on how you do it. When these babies get looking like that right there, you go in there and I take my knife or you can just crop them off there and pull you off a few leaves. Now I've seen people chop these things up and dice them up. That ain't the way we do it. Now if that's the way you've done it, that's fine. The way we do it, is we take these things just like that right there and grab them in our hand and we de-stem them. And you get that big old stem out there and you got what we call the leaf left. Now if you got a little stem in there, that's okay. So you want to take these collars after you de-stem de -stem them and you want to put them in your sink and you want to fill your sink up halfway with cold water just like you washing dishes. And you want to wash these baby three times. Put them in there, massage them up with your hand goods, wash them, take them out, put them in another one and fill it up, do it again, do it three times, and you're gonna get what them old timers call lice off of them. Actually, what that is is aphids. This time of year, you're allowed to have an aphid or two on there, and it gets all your bugs off. Now, after you get them washed three times, you got them de-stemmed, you got them washed three times, you're gonna fry you some bacon and one of them big cast iron frying pans. Take your bacon out when it gets done, set it to the side, because we're gonna use it after a while. Leave that bacon grease in there and put them collards in that frying pan and let them fry down for just a little bit. And then take them out and eat them with some bacon. And better than that, have your little cornbread over to the side and that is fine. And it's simple to do. For you folks out there that ain't never tried it, you got to try that right there. Fresh collards out of the garden, fried down with some bacon grease. And have you a side of bacon and a little cornbread? That's a meal within itself. I do mine a, a slightly different, but kind of the same way. Now I know I cut mine up, because if you cook this whole leaf right here, then you go to eat it. It's like eating a skeddy noodle. It's about well, a yard. A lot of people do cut it's them like up. yard long, and and uh, so so I'll take these and I'll cut them up or, or tear them up in little pieces or whatever. And um, I boil mine first with some ham hock or uh, neck bone or whatever, and I'll put them in a pot and boil them for about an hour or so. And then I get that skillet hot after I cook some bacon, and I put them in there and crisp them up. Just makes them a little bit more tender that way. Takes a little longer. It does take longer. If you're in a crunch, you can throw them in some bacon grease, and within about 10 minutes, you can have your meal. I've done that twice this week. But you can get, you, you plant them things now, come spring, March or so, you'll have collard plants three or four foot tall. And it's a gift that keeps on giving because you crop them leaves off there, and you come out there and about in a week later and just gonna put on some more and you get some more. That's right. So if you a grown man out there and you ain't never eating no collard greens, you don't need to be telling nobody that. You need to be eating some collard greens. All right, a few more things. Uh, Move on. We had mind. a carrot plant video come out on Tuesday and um, you can't always get this. You, Mother Nature don't always cooperate. But if you can schedule your carrot plant right before you can get about a day or two of slow drizzling rain, that's going to do you wonders. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't want to plant them before you're going to get a gully washer. But if you can plant them before you get some slow drizzling rain like we had the last few days, nothing better for it. Yep. Just like old Jeff Lauber says, he grows lots of carrots, but he don't really like to eat them. But you got to keep that seabed wet for at least seven days, uh, which is hard for a lot of people to... to uh, to do or fathom, but but that's the trick. I'm trying it again, so I got my carrots planted. I've been keeping them wet. We got this good slow rain this week. I'm gonna try to grow me a crop of carrots this year. Well, we'll see. We'll, we'll see, see how I do. I might have to get coaching on yeah. that. And then another video we had coming out, I got my shallots planted and I used my double dibble wheel. I straddled the drip tape and I wanna tell you that worked. If you haven't seen that video, you need to go <coughs> check that out. It's just beautiful to watch that thing work and one thing i didn't mention in the video that i really like about this dibble wheel is to change out these dibbles and stuff you don't really need if i can get this one it's a nine sixteenths wrench if you do need one you don't really need a tool to change these you can pretty much tighten these by hand they don't have to be 
you know, completely tighten down with a torque wrench or anything to work. So you can just, you got your dibble wheel with that bolt inside of it there and you can hand tighten these and move them around. So you don't have to have a wrench, which is nice if you don't have one handy. I used them the other day when I planted my elephant garlic and I also used it when I planted my shallots. I'm not gonna use it on my elephant garlic. I'm gonna dig me a little deeper trench on my elephant garlic. I'm gonna have video coming out. Um, well, my, I had worked my soils. My soil was real soft. Now, when I run that through there, it worked out really good because it went down pretty deep. I got you. So I still got elephant garlic plant leeks or onions coming from Dixondale. Just taught them the other day. So lots of stuff going on there. Uh, and the last thing I want to show here is some lettuce. Folks, if you're growing lettuce transplants, this is what they should look like. This is some Cherokee lettuce here. Hold the other end of that so I can talk here. When you grow lettuce transplants, for the most part, they should be fairly confined or lower to the soil. If you start getting lettuce transplants growing out this tall, this long, something ain't right with your lighting. You got your light way too high and they're trying to climb toward it and they're getting leggy. These were grown with natural sunlight and that's a perfect stand right there. Yeah, so this is Cherokee and it won't be long for these guys to be ready to go in the ground. I'm not gonna tug on one now because I know they're not ready. But uh, they'll be ready in no time. They'll be ready before you know it. Now, one thing I want to mention on these right here, when we started getting true leaves, when these things first come up, they're going to have two little leaves on there. And that's not what we consider true leaves. Right. The next set of leaves after that is true leaves. When I start seeing those true leaves develop, putting on there, then I start injecting my 20, 20, 20 in on these. And that's when you start really seeing them start to pop. If you don't hit them with some fertilizer pretty quick here, then you, your plants are not gonna look real healthy. As soon as you start seeing that, that true leaf coming on there, you need to get something on them. And on these red lettuces like the Cherokee, you don't start seeing that red color until the, uh, the set of true leaves come out there. The, when you plant them, those first leaves that come up, they look pretty much the same regardless of variety. But this is what lettuce should look like. Shouldn't be long and stemmy, kind of flimsy. Should be fairly confined and low to the soil there. And now these are not rooted in all the way, but I can tell you something, in about seven days time, these will yeah. be ready. Yeah. It won't, once they get to this stage right here, and you can pop them again with some fertilizer there too, they grow in a hurry. And then right before, if you do need to harden them off right before you plant them, you can let them dry out just a little bit, and that seems to cause that root system in there to bond up better and makes them a little easier to pull. So if I am gonna harden them out, I'll let them get a little bit on the dry side right before we plant them. Yeah, if they don't pull out of the tray, they ain't ready. So once they, once I can tug on, and I know kind of what size that is, but once you can get on and pull them out of there, they're ready to go. We got a greenhouse full of lettuce right now. We do, we do. I got about every variety of pelleted lettuce we carry. All right, so covered lots of stuff going on in the garden. Lots of new videos coming. I get sweet. I got to do a sweet potato digging video. But today we want to talk about some crops that may not be at the top of people's list as far as popularity goes, yep. but crops that are really good to grow this time of year mm -hmm. that, that not a lot of people are growing, but, but should be. And uh, so we want to bounce through these and talk about some varieties we've got as far as these seeds people might not have tried before. The first one is one that we have oh, wow. shown, we've shown on the yep. show a lot in the past, eating, talking about it. And uh, we've got a lot of people who are trying kohlrabi for the first time. I know old grumpy Neanderthal's got some. He's been posting pictures in the group asking when he should pick it. Um, kohlrabi is a great fast crop you can grow this time of year. And if you live reasonably in the South or Southern United States, you can grow this all, from now on up until when it gets real hot. And it's pretty cold tolerant as well. Yeah, it comes off in about 40 days or so, 40, 45 days. And, and what I recommend doing is you can plant it direct seed it, but it does really well from transplants. As soon as you plant some, go ahead and start you some more in some trays. Succession And plant, you can just yeah. boom, 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 have Once it. Once they get about the size of a tennis ball or a small tennis ball, a tennis ball, somewhere in there you want to be got to start harvesting them. 
if they do get a little older on you, they will crack. So once they start getting ready, you need to be getting to them. Yeah, and we've got the purple Vienna and the white Vienna. Now the, the purple Vienna, I, I can't really tell a huge difference in the taste on them. But the purple Vienna makes more of a rounded bulb. This white Vienna makes more kind of a flattened bulb, almost looks like a Vidalia onion. But both of those are great and they're easy to grow. You can actually eat the leaves too. Um, the bulb grows right above the ground. You do kind of need some pruners or something to go in there and clip it. Um, but kurabi, if you've never tried kurabi, definitely need to be trying that this fall yep. or winter. Now let's get into <clears throat> some greens. Everybody loves greens. <clears throat> and uh, I've got, I haven't did a video because I don't think I grew any of these last year, but I've got several older videos out there talking about this premium greens mix here. And if you want a good cut and come again greens mix that you could eat raw as a salad or that you can saute like you mentioned doing with those collard greens, this right here is the way to go. If you've got your little raised bed or even a little container or you can set you out a little bed in your garden and direct seed them, these are good. We've got these in bigger quantities in quarter pounds, I think. Yeah, it's, fair. it's not very expensive seed. It's a good one. We know we need to do a video of growing those in trays. Well, I don't think we've done that before, but if you're limited on space, you can grow these in trays and have you a nice salad mix right yeah. close to you. you know, like your, your bottom trays yeah. that you use for your indoor seed trays, you can put some soil in there, plant them in there, and grow them indoors, and they work really 20 well. 20 days, way. you can have some greens from the time you plant them. They grow off real quick. And you can usually cut them at least, I'd say, three or four, sometimes five times. Yeah. Um, so so really you get a lot of biomass a lot of vegetables off these guys because they're cutting coming in now so we talked about the greens mix i want to talk about some of the individual components of this greens mix um because we sell those individually as well and and, and i'm going to plant a couple beds of these some of these individually so one of the components of that uh greens mix is a green called mizuna and you probably had this before, you just didn't know it. You go to any kind of, I won't say high-end restaurant, but mid to nice restaurant, and you have a little spring mix salad there, it's got this right here in it. It's got kind of an in-size leaf on it. These get pretty good size, but you can cut them small or big. And um, I really like these, and I think I'm gonna plant me a whole bed of these guys. Um, yeah, they're not real spicy. No, no, they're not. It's milder than a mustard green. Mm -hmm. uh, so those Mizunas are really good. The other one here is called Totsoy. And this is, a lot of people call this mustard spinach because it looks like spinach, but it tastes more like mustard. Uh, reminds me a lot of that Savannah mustard, that mm -hmm. real specialty mustard we grew at the Expo. This has a little more bite to it than the Mizuna does. But it, it, it's kind of very mustardy flavor. Uh, these, these can get big. If you let them get bigger, you can cut them small. And um, I'm going to grow me a whole bed of these as well. I really like the tot soy. The leaves are a little more... The Mizuna leaves are, are pretty tender. These leaves right here have a little more structure to them. They hold up a little better. They store a little better. And then we've got arugula, which very popular right here. A lot of people like to grow this one. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of restaurants serve that right by itself. Yeah, you, if you've never had arugula, I bet you have, you just didn't know yep. it. Uh, it's really good to eat as well. Definitely worth growing a little bed or a little spot of that. And then the last one here is the uh, red mustard greens. And uh, this is probably the spiciest out of the, the three. Uh, it's real kind of sharp mustard flavor, but when you mix it with the others, it gives a nice little contrast. So I got me a little four before raised bed out in my garden out there, and I planted a slap full of those red mustard greens, and I harvested them earlier this week, and I did the little stir fry salt turf thing then, and they actually the broth was actually red. I thought they may end up cooking out green, but the, the broth, you know, if you're a beginner getting into this kind of stuff, it's probably not something you want to eat by itself. It was good to me, but it does have kind of a strong mustard flavor to it. I cut them real small, put them in a little grocery bag, carried them down there to the house, fried them up with some bacon, that good stuff. Anything that's red is good for you too, yeah. so that's always good to eat. 
So those are our greens. We've got the greens mix and then we've got the individual ones there. So you can, you can try each of those and see how you like them. Another one here, this one is fairly popular, but you'd be surprised there's a lot of people who have never grown it before and that's Swiss chard. And if you have a lot of insect pressure, a lot of bug pressure, this is the crop to grow in the fall and winter. I would, in my opinion, that is the easiest green to grow. It's the most hardiest, easiest green to grow. If you're a beginner or you have a little issues growing greens, you need to try your Swiss chard. For some reason, the pests just don't seem to bother it. And uh, we grow them from transplants, but you can direct seed them as well. And, and they're pretty. And I have to admit, it's not my favorite green, but it is definitely one of the most hardiest out there. It is hardy. I like to eat eat them sauteed or they saute down pretty quickly. They don't take as long to cook as say like a collard does, but a little bit longer than a mustard. The good thing about these is you can eat the stems too. So you can cut up those stems. Uh, I dice them up like you would celery, throw them in the pot there and it gives some nice texture and color. The other two things, uh, or excuse me, the, the next crop we're gonna talk about are leeks. And I grew leeks for the first time last year, and I already got some of these Mateco leeks planted. I got some of these Tadorna leeks ready to go in the ground. So leeks are an allium, like onions, but leeks are not day length sensitive. So whereas we plant our onions in November and harvest in um, early spring, these leeks, we can boom, 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 succession plant these guys and basically grow leeks from now on through May probably. Yeah, one of our customers come by the other day and I'm, I'm, I don't have a lot of experience with leeks, but she was telling me, Miss Sharon was telling me she likes to roast them. Yeah, so a lot of people will take them, you can put them on the grill too, you basically take that white part there mm -hmm. and you can cut it in half or do it whole and you just throw it on the grill, roll it around, yep. uh, get a nice little char on them. They're really good to eat. They're easy to grow, leeks are easy to grow. And then the last thing I want to talk about is what we call Chinese cabbage, mm -hmm. which is kind of a broad category. Several things fall into it. Um, the first one we have here, this Chinese cabbage is a little more tender than your um, traditional hard cabbage. And uh, it can come in all different shapes and sizes. So the one we have here is what they call spring crisp Chinese cabbage. It's a nice looking cabbage. So this is a little more tender. Uh, very similar to like a Napa cabbage. And this one makes kind of elongated head. These, these greens are really, really good. You can saute them or we make like cabbage soup with them, put some mm. sausage and beans. And then we've got our bok choy or pak choy, same thing. Yeah, I've been growing these for a number of years now. Uh, they use these in stir fry in Asian dishes. So if you go to an Asian restaurant and you have these stir fries, this is what you get right here real easy to grow uh, they're very tender and uh, they grow quick yeah these these go off real quick we got two varieties today. here we've got the joy choy and the i'm not really sure how to pronounce this Feng king uh the joy choy is a little lighter colored stem this one is a little darker uh, they both taste pretty much the same just depends on what color you're looking for you can eat the stems on these so the way i do it is i just go at the base and cut them like you would lettuce You've got the whole thing there you can chop up and cook. A lot of people will use them as baby grains and you can do a cut and come again yeah. uh, if you don't let them get too big. One good thing about them is they have an upright growing characteristic so they don't get real dirty. So some of these greens, some of these lettuces that we grow low, kind of close to the ground, they can be a little aggravating when you go to clean them and wash them because they hold a lot of dirt. These with these upright growth habits are a lot cleaner growing and easier to clean and to wash when you get ready to harvest them. Yeah, they're really easy to harvest and uh, really nice compact heads. Fun to grow in the garden. If you've never grown it, you should try a few. Yeah, and you can direct seed or transplant these. I've got some of these Fing Kings <clears throat> uh, in trays right now, but you can also densely plant them on a bed like you would that premium greens mm -hmm. mix. All right, so if you have any questions about any of those varieties, growing any of those, or uh, have some other unusual things or not so popular varieties that you grow this time of year, let us know in the comments. We'd be glad to hear about it. Now we're gonna get into some questions from last week's show, and if we answer your question on the show, send us an email to cussserve at hostools.com with your address, 
and we'll be glad to send you a nice little prize. So question number one comes from Alex Somersale, and Alex asked, I have Kogon grass. It comes up through all mulches. Will your silage tarp kill off Kogon grass, and what do you suggest doing to kill Kogon grass? I'm assuming I'm pronouncing that correctly. Is it Kogon or Kogan? C-O-G-O-N. So make it, Maybe, somebody make, can tell us if we're pronouncing that right or not. Either. Kogan or Kogon. I, I don't have much experience with Kogan grass. <coughs> I, I don't know where, the, I'm not looked at the distribution map, but. Um, Southeastern United States, Alabama, uh, South Carolina, and Florida, and maybe Louisiana. Georgia? In Georgia, of course, yeah. I haven't, I haven't noticed any around my place, I don't reckon. But we do have Bermuda grass around here, which can be pretty nasty to get rid of because of all the rhizomes and stuff. And from my experience so far with the Bermuda grass, uh, the tarp and teal technique has worked very good. The tarp by itself will only basically kill the vegetation. It won't get rid of those rhizomes. To kill those, you've got to have some irritation or disturbance in the soil. So we would tarp it take the tarp off, well, tarp it for two or three weeks, take the tarp off, till it, put the tarp back on, and just repeat and rinse. And we did that for, I don't know, four or five times. And it finally did get rid of all the Bermuda grass in there. So uh, not knowing Kogon grass very well, I can tell you that did work with some stubborn grasses and weeds around here. Kogon grass is some bad stuff. It's actually probably more of a forestry uh, weed than it is in a homeowner situation, but it is terrible. It's probably one of the most invasive weeds that we have in the southeast United States. It came here in about 1911 from Japan. It got in, mixed in with some seeds from some packing material and got introduced here, and it's gradually gotten worse and worse. It is a tough one to control. There's approximately 1.25 million acres contaminated in our part of the world or United States with Kogon grass. The, there is a few herbicides that's been tried to deal with it out there, but the, the method to try to control it is as Travis mentioned, you would do tarp and, and tillage. Keep it tilled and under, aggravate it to death, and use your tarp if you have it in a situation in, where in your vegetable garden, if you do, bless your heart, it's a tough one. Aggravate it to death, keep it tilled, keep it broke up, work it, use your tarp, and try to get it in control. But it is a bad, bad dude. Yeah, so the tarp is going to keep any new vegetation from forming, and then the tilling is going to break up all that underground yeah. plant structure. And, uh, it, it, you know, so it, I don't know that it, how similar it is to nut grass, but it seems it sounds like the same problems people have with nut grass. you got to aggravate it because a lot of that plant is underground, and just killing the top of it, uh, spraying a herbicide or something on it, is not going to do a lot of good because you got a lot of structure underneath the ground. What makes it so bad in the forester situation is it has a very thick thatch layer and it has a lot of uh, vegetation to it that dies down. It has a lot of thatch, it has a lot of that. So if you was to have a fire, it burns really, really hot. So that makes it bad in a forester situation. When the trees get For too trees, high. yeah. All right, our second question comes from Seeker B. And uh, he said, have you done a vlog on hand tool maintenance yet? I have, I think I got an old one out there, an old, old one? Yeah, I, I did was... a, uh, I think I did a two minute tip last year showing how I get my bat wing hoe and tip We top probably shape. should do more of that. I think I got one out there when I was probably about 20 or 30 pounds lighter and a little bit better looking than what I am now. Yeah. <laughs> These are the two, Two things that really come in handy on tool maintenance. And it's that time of the year where you really want to be thinking about getting your tools in tip-top shape. Going These old the cold, rainy days, ain't really a whole lot else to do. Get out there and get your tools sharpened up with a good farmer's file. And I like this because you ain't got to have no electricity. You can go out there and grab it. I keep one hanging in my tool shed on a nail. You can go out there and grab it, sharpen your stuff real quick. If you got your vice, it really helps. It does. You don't have to have one, but if you got your vice, you can put the neck of that tool in there and you can take that file and you can do some pretty pretty work so this is pretty much i'm going to try to wrap this up in a nutshell here on tool maintenance we can really and we should go into more detail in the video sharpen them up get all your dirt off of them clean them up make sure they clean and put you some good lean seed on those wood handles that set them up where the you know the rain won't hit them and you'll be pretty much good to go all winter till you get ready to need them next spring 
don't be bashful with the linseed oil. Uh, coat it down good. Take you a rag or something and, and soak it good and rub it all over that handle there. Now, one thing I have noticed, if you got a little camping stove or something, if you can, you got to be careful. I don't want anybody to get burnt. If you can warm this stuff up, now you don't want to get it so hot you can't deal with it, but if you warm it up, I have warmed it up on a little camp stove with an old pot up at my garden shed before, and then wipe it onto the wood. It seems to penetrate just a little bit better than it does coal. So if you, if you have capabilities of doing that, build you a little fire or whatever, warm it up in a little old pot that you're not planning on using again, take your hand and wipe it on there, it will penetrate. It spreads out a little better and it penetrates a little bit better. And if you want you a good file, we do have these on the site. We call it the farmer's file. And I, I promise you, this is a much better file than what you go get at your, your big blue or your big orange store. Hey, everybody needs a farmer's file. Uh, the linseed oil, we don't have it individually, but if you've ever bought one of our wheel host success kits, uh, it has that. In fact, the wheel host success kit has that, this, uh, you could call it a, a tool maintenance success kit just as well. Yep. Uh, cause it has a lot of stuff in there. To, to keep it has a tools. sponge in there, not a sponge, but it has a sponge, sanding block. sanding block in there. So you can sand your, a lot of times on that wood over a period of time, it'll kind of get raised up and you go in there and take that sanding block and kind of rough it off and it smooths it back down. That's when you want to put your linseed oil on there comes with a 9 16 wrench, which is what you need to change out all your implements with. Farmer's file and linseed oil. All right. So that's going to do it for today's show. Just a little update on our new studio. We're getting really, really close. Uh, really, really close on our new studio. And we're excited about showing you that. And I kind of want to, you can let me know in the comments if you'd like to see this. Before we do the new studio, I might do, we might do a little video walking through to show you how small and confined this little area we're shooting on now is uh, compared to, to what it's quite an improvement you might not be able to tell it on camera but it's quite an improvement uh, also in the comments here let us know if there's a topic we haven't covered on a show that you've been wanting to to see us talk about that's applicable for this time of year put those in the comments and let us know and we'll be glad to consider that yep. as a future show topic if you like tonight's show give us a big like give us a big thumbs up and we will see you guys next time. All right.